Welcome, fans, to a special edition of the Cheap Heat Productions Wrestling Podcast. My name is Jack Kilby, Executive Vice President of Great North Wrestling, and I'm pleased to have on a man tonight that I've waited uh, a while to interview, a fan of his work. He's a former WWF WCW competitor. He is a former Smoky Mountain Wrestling champion. His list of accomplishments are very long and most recently an author of some very, very interesting books, which will give the fans out there uh, an idea of how to purchase, etc. towards the end of the show. But everyone, I'm pleased to welcome Mr. Bobby Blaze Medley to the show. Bobby, how are you doing tonight, sir? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks. I appreciate you having me on. No, it's been a while. We've been working this thing out to, to uh, get together and stuff. It's a real pleasure. I'm looking forward to the uh, interview and the podcast. And um, I appreciate the kind words. Um, I try my best, you know, just to um, do good, like you said, to, to be entertaining on, on some of the uh, the podcasts I've done in the past and, and in my books as well, So, which we'll get into a little bit later on. But thank you very much. Yes, sir. So uh, I'd like to uh, do a, a, a basic retrospect of, of your career in the business. And the fans usually are interested in knowing – when when you were were growing up, were you a fan of the industry? And if so, did you have any particular territories uh, or companies that that you followed at the time? Yeah, well, that's that's a good question. And yes, I was a fan pretty much my entire life. Um, I've, I've told this story countless times, and I don't I don't mind telling it again. Um, in about 1969, I'm an old guy. Um, I first saw professional wrestling on the WWWF in Baltimore, Maryland. I lived there until I was almost seven. And so that's the product I watched with one of my aunts and, and one of my grandmothers on different sides of the family. Everyone lived there at one time. It was crazy. But eventually I moved to Kentucky and about four years had elapsed. And I was outside on a Saturday morning and my brother came running outside, a little bit younger than me. And he said, um, you got to come in and see us. You got to come and see this. Well, I went to the house and of course uh, we just had a little black and white TV and it wasn't a big colored console I'd seen in Baltimore, but all I caught was a tail end of uh, what, what was the Memphis wrestling. Okay. And, but it was coming back from the commercial break before it went off the air for that last little bit, you know, see you, you know, next week fans, what have you. And so my brother was trying to explain to me, this guy done a flip, this guy done a flip. And I said, well, that's pro wrestling, you know? So for the next couple of weeks, he and I tried to turn tune into you know, around 10 o'clock or 11, whatever time it was that we could get on uh, the little TV there and find that wrestling. Well, eventually we found the exact channel, you know, we had three and, and back then I think you had a couple of USA channels or whatever it was. So we're in Kentucky and about 10 years old and um, I found Memphis wrestling, you know, and it became every Saturday, you know, Saturday was either 10 or 11 or noon. Uh, they usually came on around that time. I can't recall if it was a noon time, but either way, we watched Saturday every, religiously, you know. So, yeah, I was a fan um, way back when. And then um, ICW came to town. They started up out of Lexington, Kentucky, which is like an hour and a half away from where I'm at. They started running here. I think they ran every four to six weeks live shows. Um, Memphis came in. One time, only one time they came in, um, watched them live and uh, into this area, let's say that. Uh, and then when I was about 15, um, I was walking in front of a TV set and there was, uh, I was on the way to basketball practice and there was uh, Jimmy Valiant was in the Memphis territory and he was calling out Jerry Lawler, calling him Kingfish and bragging about his 19 inch biceps and this and that. And I was like, on my way, it was uh, right over Christmas break and I walked by my buddy and his dad were walking to the living room and they're like, wow, right there. That's what I want to do when I grow up. And they looked at me like, you know, I had two heads or whatever. And so ever since then, like I said, I was about 15. I like, I, I didn't miss matches after that. My brother and I would go and set up the, um, whoever was in town, we went on, it was ITW most went up and set the ring, you know, down, set it up, tore it down, whatever they needed. Um, then, then about that time, about a year later, uh, we started getting Georgia Championship Wrestling on TBS. We were leaving on a Saturday evening, or going to leave, um, and, and my brother and I was watching TV, and a, something went off, and Georgia Championship Wrestling come on. 
and like, oh my gosh, look at this. It was guys we'd only seen in magazines and heard about, you know. So long story short on that, my buddies were coming to pick me up. Um, they called me immediately and, and there's no cell phones or anything. This is, you know, lines like, hey man, you got the, well, I go, well, I'm already on the channel because they're watching it too. They were both at one of their own the house there, at their parents' house. And uh, I said, well, let's watch this and uh, I'll see you guys in about an hour. So, so you know, we figured it's about an hour. So my brother and I watched it. We're pumped as can be. As soon as that hour went off, boom, another hour come on. My phone rang again and said, hey, whenever this goes off, we'll come out there and get you. I'm like, I'm good, you know, whatever. And so we, of course, by the time they picked up one of my other buddies, there was two of them, my other buddy, they got me. All four of us got in that car. My brother, he watched whatever the next Andy Ripper for baseball or whatever, you know. But I left because I was you know, 16 years old, ready to go out and hang out. And uh, those guys picked me up and all night, I mean, all we talked about was the damn two hours of wrestling. You know, I mean, they were one of them was a couple years older than me, uh, school wise. And and so, you know, they, they had driven and been out to a couple of places. And, and back then, you in, in Huntington or in West Virginia, you'd get beer at 18. Well, if you was 15 or 16 looked anywhere like that, they'd just give you a beer at 18. So we, we would go out to this place called a pub. And that evening, it was just like, no, I don't care. I don't think any girls, if they did approach us, we just talked about wrestling. <laughs> I don't, you know, light drinker back then, just have a beer. You're like, whoa, you know. And But we all, all us four guys talked about was wrestling, you know. And then we found out it started coming on. So every Saturday night, you know, so we had sun, uh, Saturday uh, afternoon with the Memphis. Um, we had the Saturday evening with the um, uh, Georgia Championship. And uh, – then we had, you know, late at night because they had got a they had got a really uh, late late deal with like eleven thirty or twelve o'clock midnight that ICW they had a good chat they had a good time but they got switched and I talked to Rip Rogers about that it was some kind of a they got you know wonky there on the the time or switch station or whatever so we got quite a bit of that and then um, when I went off to, uh, to college a few years later. Um, USA Network was on that college was on that um, uh, cable system. It was just coming up, so then I started getting you know uh, di different. I don't, I don't know if it was USA. I, I may be wrong on that, but eventually I got to where I had been to Baltimore uh, to visit relatives and stuff through the years. So I'd seen WWF or you know back in the day in the magazines. Of course, my uncle he lived there. He would mail us. Uh, my brothers and I we would mail the. Um, programs back and forth if, if we saw a good card in, in Huntington, Ashland, Lexington, or wherever. Like I said, my buddies, we start driving around. I'm towns I mentioned like Charleston, West Virginia, Huntington, West Virginia, Lexington, Kentucky, and then you know in this area, this tri-state area. So I got to go to quite a bit of shows and just, just with a huge fan. And um I, I loved it that away, you know. So yeah, from a long, long time ago, it's just a, a passion, you know, of my choice of um sport you know this is i really enjoyed it and my friends did as well most of them we were crossover athletes from you know basketball wrestling football uh as i got over a couple weightlifters at the gym that everyone we had a little click you know that was in our in our city even though we might live you know across uh, two and a half miles three miles apart but we got together at that gym or at pool or at the basketball court <laughs> if it wasn't nba playoffs or you know the world series or whatever it, it was always wrestling you know so yeah, yeah. Sounds sounds familiar. Can you talk about your your dis, your training uh, process and your your initial breaking in and and how that uh, how that yeah. went down, Bobby? Yeah, sure. So I was a fan, and um, I was uh, working in a school program, uh, of computer aided instruction. I was basically a teacher's instructor, uh, a teacher assistant. I'm sorry, uh, out of college, and I had about almost three years of college, but I, I dropped out because I knew everything when I was 21, man. Let me tell you, I was smart, you know, Jack, I was smart. But uh, anyway, wrestling wasn't painting out right away that. So I took this uh, teaching assistant position and I really, really loved it a lot because uh, I was going to be a teacher and a coach and, and, and go that route um, when I was in college. Well, anyway, I, uh, I said, I'm, I'm trying to live this dream, man. I want to, you know, I was lifting weights, get in shape. Well, I had some magazines that had, you know, different numbers in them. I'd find them in the back of, you know, Pro Wrestling Illustrator or something. And anyway, long story short, I found a number for the Monster Factory. And I called them up. And they said, yeah, come on up. So I went up there. I drove up there. And um, 
I, Charlie Fortin put me in a ring, let me do a couple of things, hit the ropes and this and that. And I was about, like I said, about 22 at the time, 22 and a half and good shape, good, you know, body and this and that. And, and then um, Larry Sharp come in. He had been doing some evening, pod, not a podcast, but a TV show like the PM things or something. And he's like, yeah, well, it's X amount of dollars and, you know, blah, blah, blah. You move here, no guarantees. Uh, you know, you might get a match or two, whatever. And, uh, and I was still teaching school, and it, this was the middle of the school year, but I'd had a couple, three days off there, one of those little long weekends they give you or something, whatever it was, and uh, professional development day or something. Well, anyway, uh, I was like, oh, man, I don't know if I want to move to, move there or not, but I, I, I got an idea, you know. So I started writing more people. And um, this guy locally, he started, he said, hey, I, I can train you. I can train you. And I was like, okay, well, that sounds good. Well, he trained me just enough to, and he's a sweetheart of a guy um, named Rick Newsom. And, and I drove up to his house. It was like two and a half hours away. And I'd go there once or twice a week. And he had this little platform like a, a ring, but it wasn't really a ring. And he was trying to show me a couple things, but he did smart me up enough that, you know, hey, we'll, We'll put you um, on a couple of shows with these local promoters. Well, in the meantime, again, I was sending out fillers and, and flyers uh, to uh, to different people. And I sent one to a gentleman named uh, Marvin Joel in Minneapolis, Minneapolis. And he wrote me back this really nice letter about the Malenko camp in Tampa, Florida. And he talked about the Malenkos being some of the best craftsmen in the business and sent me some flyers from the show. Now, all I had was old 8 by 10 black and white bodybuilding pictures and things like that's what I was sending out so <clears throat> long story short I had my first match September 11th 1988 in Hayside Virginia and it was just a street brawl uh with myself and Rick Newsom and I don't know what to tell them we're in there basically fighting blah, 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 boom you know like third match in the car didn't put us on there because he 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 knew these guys he could wrestle you know he but I just didn't know enough at that point and by December of that year um it was uh Jimmy Valiant, of all people, and I, I love Boogeyman of Death. He was in, he was the main event with Hector Guerrero as Lasertron against uh, Buddy Landell. And I think it's supposed to be Dutch Mantel, but anyway, the other person didn't show up. And I was again third match with Rick Newsom. We did a hardcore before it hardcore. We just, you know, we tried to re wrestle, but it was just a fight. And and uh, he was a local policeman up there, and, and he went on to a great law enforcement career. I might add that he's federal. You know, DEA or something retired now, but just say he was a good, good dude. And Buddy Landell told him, Motor said, Hey, I had the blonde hair and I was tanned in the wintertime, you know. And, and we was, and Buddy Landell said, Hey, put that boy right there with me. And I'm like, Oh, fuck, this is Buddy Landell, you know, yeah. and that, that's Laser Tron and, and, and Jimmy Valiant. And so um, he said, Just listen to me. And we got out there and Buddy and Laser Tron locked up. And I tell this story, I saw him lock up. And I saw Buddy tell the referee, he's got my hair back here. The referee went around, and I saw uh, him pull the mask. And Hector took a simple bump, and I said, oh, shit. This, these guys are working. <laughs> this, mm -hmm. I need to get smart enough up. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So they mm -hmm. put me in, and, and Buddy said, just listen. And I, I just listened, and they led me around the ring, and it was so easy. And at the end, Jimmy caught me behind the arms and, he said, catch him, brother, and laser try and come across. And I caught him one, two, three. It was thank you, brother. Like, this is what this is this is the way it's supposed to be. And so uh, I talked to Buddy in the locker room. I thanked him and and he he said, Man, I said, What do you do? I gotta get this thing off the screen. It's bugging me to death. Um, I said, he said, What do you I said, What do you do? He goes, You gotta get experience, just keep getting experience. He goes, You'll always be green until you, you know, just keep learning, you know. I'm like, okay. Well, little did I know, he'd been trained by Malenko. So I went to Tampa, Florida that following May. I, I went to Orlando, and I, I made arrangements to go to Tampa. I didn't have anyone I knew at that point in Tampa, but I knew guys that needed a roommate in Orlando. And uh, I said, you know, that's, that's what I'm going to do. So I got a whole Malenko's camp, and uh, I went down there, and he put me in a ring and called a little match for me. And, and Malenko called it, and uh, we stepped out behind the, the, the deal there at the building, and he said, um, you know, well, you know, you look like you play for sports. You look like you're an athlete. You know, he goes, um, but I want you to do me if, if you're going to do this, here's, here's the deal. I want you to forget everything you know about professional wrestling and let me start you at, at 
face number one, square number one. He said, because he said, God bless them, them guys up there in West Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee. All they want to do is hit each other, poke, poke them in the eyes, pull their hair and kick. And he said, I'm not going to teach any of that. He goes, I'm going to teach you how to wrestle. And I was like, yes, sir. So that whole summer, um, I, I went down there about as many times as I could per week, two, two to three times a week, just uh, commuted uh, about 90 miles from where I lived at. And then in um, by uh, late August, early September, a room opened up, and um, I moved to Tampa. And I delivered pizzas for Domino's. I'd done this job, I'd done that job. You know, I went to Florida young, single, no major bill. I had a car payment, you know, maybe 150 bucks a month or something. So it wasn't like, uh, you know, then I had roommates. I, we played, you know, you know how you are when you're young. You just everyone split the room, and uh, uh, we had a real nice place that was just, uh, you know, bachelor pad basically. And, Everyone just took care of their own shit. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I told them guys, I said, hey, I'm out of here, man. I'm going to go down to Tampa. And basically the same thing. I rented a room off of a sweet lady named Phyllis Lee, who helped a lot of the guys in the careers. She was friends of the Malenkos. And, um, you know, I ended up meeting all the Malenkos, uh, Bob Cook, Sean Waltman, um, just so many Willie Wilkerson Jr. So many guys were there, Rico Federico, um, just a bunch of guys were there that were athletes and could wrestle and I just fit right in, man. Um, because I was I was eating up with it like and I again I was delivering pizzas. I just traded for one dominoes to another at that point. And uh Malenko gave me a chance, you know, and got me in and taught me for four months, four times a week, my schedule I I didn't miss. I was there, you know, learning under the learning tree. About about a couple months into it, Dean had been over in Japan quite a bit. He started coming more to the camp and he said, Hey, dad said, you're, you're really coming along. You're athletic and this and that. He, he really started helping me a lot. You know, that, that was a tremendous, you know, help. And then, um, really, uh, uh, there was another guy came to the, uh, to the camp and he, he, he knew I was delivering pizzas and he had, he'd been wrestling some and he, uh, he owned his own business and he said, um, Hey, uh, man, I just lost, it was, it was uh, carpet installation and he said i've lost my partner he said uh, uh and there were some things going on at the room and this and that that, that the camp there and he said once you move in with me he goes room and board's taken care of and he goes i'll pay you x amount of dollars per week he said but the main thing is this i want to really be here for training so anytime there's a wrestling training we won't miss it and if you're if they book you on these shows i'll let you off work no no questions asked i know you didn't move 1500 miles from from Kentucky to be here to, to be a carpenter installer. You're going to be a wrestler, you know. And that's what Rick told me, too. He said, man, your aspirations are way more than what mine are for this business. If you're going to Florida and you're going to Malenko's, he didn't know who they – I mean, he might know who their name or whatever. He goes, because they – you know, Malenko used to work for the old ICW back when, when I was a young boy, you know. And um, anyway, that's – Malenko just, you know, took me to – man, lock up everything I knew – um, I just tried to like, ah, oh, yeah, don't need to punch one, poke me. I grabbed the rope, whatever, learned to wrestle. And I learned from the mat up. And like I said, had a good, good lot of little athletes there that, um, that had come and trained there with them. And it was a, a tremendous opportunity and a, a real blessing to get to go to, um, to, to be a part of that, you know, and I had guys through the years that I got to meet, uh, I was on, when I first got in Smoky Mountain, which we'll go into that minute. Uh, I saw Kevin Sullivan just come, and I'd met him in Florida, but just briefly, he come across that ring, and I just knew damn good and well he was just going to chop me because I seen him, you know. And uh, and I love Kevin; I think he's one of the greatest minds in wrestling. And mm -hmm. as soon as he locked up, he goes, "I heard Larry Malenko trained you, boy." And I said, "Yes, sir, yes, sir." But his accent, you know. And then Wahoo, I was on an independent show while I was in Smoky, and uh, I just sent word. I said. They, they just want to fill in. And I, I was there and I said, just tell them Malenko trained me. And as soon as we got in the ring, he was locked up to me in the corner. He goes, don't you ever tell someone Malenko trained you don't think you're trying to stretch him. <laughs> he just started wrestling me. He says, keep up. And I started wrestling him. I was like, you know, and at the end, I knew to come back. I chop, chop, you know. So all these guys, I saw the respect, you know, and heard the respect that his name carried. Uh, because what I did, I started off a lot of conditioning. I went out on a hot August asphalt in Tampa doing 10 and ones, Hindu push-ups, Hindu squats, uh, mm -hmm. set up neck bridges, 
uh, just doing all that stuff. And he saw that I was hungry, you know. And again, uh, I've just really started thinking about this in the, in the last little bit when I look, when I, as perspective looking back, hindsight being 2020, where I, I say, you know, he knew I didn't move 1,500 miles also to not, to be a lazy ass and not work at what I've done, you know. And um, they had a little TV down there called Sun um, Suncoast Pro Wrestling, a little public access TV uh, for, for an older guy like myself. You probably remember I, I talked to someone the other day. Oh, I do remember, you know, mm-hmm. but now I guess you got all the streaming and, and this and that. Mm-hmm. And like, mm-hmm. He asked me if I'm going to do TV. And, of course, um, I still deliver a pizza at that point. And I like, I, he goes, well, how much you make delivering pizzas? I go, it was a Tuesday night or something. I said, 50 bucks. And, on a bad night, you know, and he goes, well, he goes, it's only to pay about twenty twenty five dollars It's down in Sarasota, uh, maybe next month. I, I was like, oh, I want to go. He goes, you got to pay your bills. He goes, it don't make sense to drive to Sarasota for twenty or twenty five dollars when you can stay home and make fifty. And I was like, mm-hmm. oh, okay, he he cares more about me than like, hey, I'm gonna go down here and put you on TV and pay you this kid and beat the hell out of whatever. So mm-hmm. I, I scheduled the next one off, of course, uh, for the TV, and um, you know, I got. The, see some of that and then once i started doing that and again it wasn't a lot of money but I, you know i rode with dean and we you know pitched in i started doing little tvs once a month while i was there and just uh, uh started learning that you know all those things helped me so when i finally got you know a break um it, it all paid off from that training you know and mm-hmm. uh, again him taking an interest in me but but also me putting into it you know you get get out of sometimes what you put into it and I was putting a lot into it. So you you had a very strong foundation, old school training, as we call it. And and in '91, you started to do uh, some shots on uh, WWF uh, syndicated TV. Two part question Keep here. Shot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How did that come about? And do you remember working Piper? Because I yes. I distinctly recall that match too. Yes. What had happened was I had went to. Uh, uh, Canada up to uh, a Mill Dupree's old Grand Prix territory. And I did like 17, 18 week tour, man. We got there from like July or excuse me, June. No. Yeah. July, June, all the way through October when they start playing hockey up there. So I got to go to uh, New Brunswick, uh, Nova Scotia and out of Prince Edward Island and uh, seven nights a week, man, it was really good experience. And um, Goldie Roger was there. Uh, mm-hmm. Bad Boy Eddie Watts was there, uh, Rotten Ron Starr, and mm-hmm. uh, Leo Burke, man. I learned so much from Leo. The second year I went, step ahead, Cuban Assassin Angel was there. And, man, did I ever learn so much from that guy, you know. So I had all these great guys to work with. So when I got there, again, the rep, the wrestling reputation preceded me, which was good. But also, now it's the time to learn to work. Well, hell, anyone could do a suplex, Bobby Blaze. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> You're know, five minutes into the match. This is what you do. And you started getting that psychology. Oh, okay. Um, Ron would do a DDT. Well, you don't do it in the middle of that. You do it. That's a fit. You know, so you learn these things, how to put together. So that what had happened, um, I came back from up there and I was going to go back to Florida uh, at the beginning of the year. That was my plan. So when I finished up that tour in October, I'd been up there, you know, every friggin' night in shape, uh, working hard. And I was watching TV. I don't know if it's Saturday, Sunday, Monday, whatever it was. Anyway, it was a uh, probably you know USA Network uh, Tuesday Night Titans or Superstars on Saturday, whatever it fucking was. I don't know. And I saw a couple of my buddies on there, and I was like, "Well, damn, I just was wrestling with these. Well, how they?" So I called one of my buddies in Tampa. Like I knew it's took delay, of course. And he said, "Man, he said, just show up in a building if they come to your area and, and, and tell them uh, ask for um, JJ Dillon." And tell them Larry trained you. Like, oh, okay. So I heard they was coming to Huntington Civic Center, which is in 20 minutes from my house, right across the border here in Kentucky. And uh, I went up there, asked for JJ, and I spoke to him. Well, that was the first territory he had worked way back in the day, was out in the month in that whole area. He knew when I said mm-hmm. Leo Burke and his beast, the beast man, the brother, you know, and I said, uh, uh, I got to work with the Cormier brothers, you know what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. oh, you know, and I told Malenko I trained me, and he knew Malenko, of course, and he knew them guys up there. He goes, well, you know, probably just come in, and and uh, I can't tell you who you're going to work against. He said, but I can, I can for sure put you on the show. I'm like, okay. So, 
what happened on that Piper match, here's how it all started. That was my first night in. And uh, I, again, I didn't know what to expect. Um, you know, I, I didn't expect to be some main event or, or you know, what they want to do. And I'm sitting on a table talking to my brother, just, you know, get, like you're just kicking it like this, you know. We're in the back by superstars. And um, Piper comes walking in, and we've been there for probably two and a half, three hours of time. And, uh, you know, I spoke to some guys I knew. Uh, there was Brady Boone was on the show, Pez Watley, some of those guys that was working, you know, uh, back then. I knew uh, them guys from Tampa or from ICW. So I, I was, knew a couple of them, plus some of them knew I was working in Canada, asked about so-and-so and blah, blah, blah. All of a sudden, Piper comes by, and he walked right by me, and he's just dragging his bag. I honestly look like he just kind of, man, I've been out here this road for a long time. and uh, But I'm Roddy Piper, and I'm going to do, come, and go as I please. That was just the whole, like, he's just walking through. I'm like, fuck, that's Roddy Piper, you know. And uh, he stops, he turns around, looks at me, goes, hey, you. Oh, yeah. He goes, who are you working tonight? And I go, and now he's up closer to me because he's walking probably 10 or 20 feet away. He goes, hey, and I said, I don't know you. It's not even on the board yet. He goes, I have an idea. You care to do something? And I was like, okay, sure. You know, and I have no idea. So we're in the back of the civic center and we go into a bathroom in the back of the back. And he goes, Hey, you know, he, we talk, we're talking. It's not like, you know, he, he did. I'm like, that's a body piper. I got an idea. I'm doing this, this program with Rick Flair. Um, it's a deal, a chair with Flair, blah, blah, blah. And we're just walking. He goes, uh, here, let's just step here. So I go into the bathroom and he goes, I'll be right back. Well, what probably was two to five minutes seemed like an hour because I'm like, fuck it. I just got ribbed big time. Piper ribbed me. He just took me into the bathroom and, and, and left my ass there, you know. But uh, again, the door swings open and here's Piper. And he goes, hey, Rick, it's that guy I tell you about. Uh, Bobby, is that right? I go, yeah, I, go, I put my ass in Bobby Blaze. I go, uh, Bobby Smedley is what they're having me use tonight. And he goes, here's my idea. And he laid it out. He goes, now here's what I want you to do. He goes, you're the heel, just call a match, and um, you know the Bulldogs will finish. I said, yes, sir. And he goes, uh, now, when you're laying there, and I took chair shots in Canada from fucking Eddie and Goldie and everyone, you know, hard chair shots, you know. But uh, but he goes, now, if it's there at the end, I'm going to get a chair. But I don't really want to hit you. I want you to be getting out of the ring. He said, but, but stay with me. And I'm like, okay. And then on the way up to gorilla position, he said, Bobby, he goes, and this is a true story. I'm not enhancing or anything. I, I could enhance it more, but I'm just telling you, this is, to me, good enough. He says, hey, Bob, I want you to be a favor. I go, yeah. And I turn back around. I'm in Gorilla because I'm going out first, you know, to where I'm in a ring. There's no music because you know, I'm you're there to do the job, whatever. Uh, be enhancement talent. What do you want to call it? Well, he says, I want you to spit on me. And I said, what? He goes, when I get close enough, lean out and spit on me. And I said, I said, man, I said, I'm a pretty good spitter. I'm not going to I, I could spit. There was some of my spitting. I was just, when I was a kid, we spit on a tree or like a target practice. Something. And I was like, I would go cough up a you know, big goober, but I was like, I could spit. I was like, and I, you can take what it's worth. I'm a good spitter. But uh, anyway, I go, all right, if you're sure. And, and then he goes, and that chair is there at the end. I'll get you. I go, all right. And so I come out and you've seen the match. I'm out mm. there. right. He's within range, and I'm like, I let it go, man. I, I mean, I fucking get him right in the eye. <laughs> I mean, I spit in Roddy Piper's eye. And that's one of my stories in my book. Like, and when I did, you know, he fucking comes unwound. He comes in there, and we go at it, you know. And, and he goes, "What is it, kid?" I said, "Turnbuckle, turnbuckle, turnbuckle, backdrop." And he goes, "You got it." He goes, "You ready?" I go, "Yeah, bulldog." And he goes, "Okay." And I was with that corner and fed out, boom, you know, at one, two, three. And then I saw him go out and grab the chair. And, man, it was so perfect because his timing and just professionalism, he slid back in with it. I was supposed to be getting away. Right as I start going over the edge, man, he just, I mean, it just brushed my back so easy, so professional. And I took my own little bump. I was like, fuck, this is, it was right, you know. So that's how that happened. He thanked me when I got in the back. And uh, uh, I went back to the table and they said, hey, you know, we're going to be in uh, these other places, which I ended up going to, uh, uh, let's see, Bo uh, shit, Toledo, Ohio, uh, uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, and some things like that before the first of the year. Well, then I was moving to Tampa. Like I said, I, I planned on going back there after the first year. And I said, hey, you got anything in January? And they said, yeah, but 
you know, we're going to be, we're doing a, a Florida and we don't pay that, you know, these are areas that five hour radius, which I didn't know about at the time at 300 miles. Or I said, no, I'm moving to Florida. I'll be in Tampa. They go, oh, okay. And they gave me, uh, excuse me, um, Daytona beach and, um, um, Fort Myers, uh, Florida, Fort, somewhere down that way, way gave me like, that's how I got to do those TV gimmicks. And, um, I was doing independence, you know, down there, just, I did the sportatorium on Tuesday nights, Pat Tanaka, uh, got me in down there, him and my buddy and Jumbo Beretta was there. And, and I knew a lot of guys, like I said, I met Kevin Sullivan there again, some of these guys just briefly, but fact is you get bookings. And, um, I, uh, I kid you not. They, there was a couple guys that were still doing, uh, guys that eventually went to WCW and does some enhancement talent. This was, they were still doing it. Bob Cook and a few other guys were doing it for WWE back after whatever it was. And they were going to do something up in the panhandle, like two, maybe three days up in the panhandle of Florida. And um, I called the office. They said, yeah, we'll put you on. But this was for February. And um, I said, okay, yeah, that's right. But I didn't have any lot of money in the meantime, you know, so I'm like, and, you know, The Rock talks about eight bucks. I had like maybe seven bucks. <laughs> and I'm saying with my brother at this time, he he was a minister. He still is a great guy. Um, he's a chaplain for hospice. And I really, uh, Jim Smedley, you know, he's, he's one of them blowing angels, man. I mean, but he, he already had it work. That was going to be his first job. And they had a room and board for him and all that. So I was just going to wrestle. So I wasn't out a whole lot. Plus, I lived there before, before I went to Canada, you know, so. Anyway, uh, I went down, believe it or not, to the home shopping network and took a test. <laughs> and I'm waiting to like three weeks away for that bigger payoff for WW getting no, I'm getting two shots I, you know, up in Fort Walt or Fort Walton or whatever the beach, beach Walton Beach, well, somewhere up for that panhandle. Panama City, maybe. I don't know. But anyway, I, it's a rainy damn Tuesday morning. And I know I'm gonna be training that evening, and I'm laying there and the phone rings, and um, it's um I think it's home shopping network. They told me I passed the test. You just listen to the speaker and type in your information. You know, hey, I'm Jack. I'm ordering this or that. Well, hell, I'm smart enough to figure that out. You know, I can use to type and all that. Well, it wasn't. It was Ron Starr. And he said, Bobby, he said, uh, he said, what are you doing? I said, nothing. I said, just wrestling in Florida. So I'm training. He goes, well, what are you doing tomorrow? And I'm like, I don't know. I just took a job for the home shopping at where I said, I hope we're doing some TV for New York next, you know, next couple of days, next week or two. He goes, man, he goes, I got us booked in South Africa. I said, what? And he said, yeah, I got us booked in South Africa for the month of February. And um, he said, thousand dollars a week. He goes, can you, can you be at the Tampa airport tomorrow at noon? There'll be tickets waiting on you. I was like, are you kidding me? And he gave me all the information. It was on the up and up. I said, man, you're fucking with me. You're down in Tampa, aren't you? I see you at the office down here. What'd you do? Come down? He goes, no, Bobby, I'm in a gym in Atlanta. He goes, I'm telling you. He goes, um, it was the uh, Rip Rip, uh, Rip Morgan and, and Jack Victory. They couldn't do it. They got called to do something else. And they said, we need two guys to come over here and wrestle for, you know, it was, it was All-Star Championship Wrestling. It was in South Africa, Cape Town, mm -hmm. Johannesburg, Durban. Uh, Peter Mitzvah, all South Africa for like 28 days. I'm like, oh shit, okay. Well, I called New York. You know, I called the off the number I had and I said, hey, I told him my name. I said, I was supposed to be, you know, whatever the date was. Um, I, I didn't want to burn a bridge, you know. And I said, I'm going to be, uh, I took another bookie out of the country and I, it pays a little bit better. And I'm going to, they, they basically, the lady that answered the phone was like, I don't know who the fuck you are anyway, but. Like, thanks for calling kind of thing. You know what I'm saying? It was a courtesy thing, but she was professional. I'm just saying she probably didn't know the fuck. Okay, we'll mark you off the list. You know, you don't want to fucking work. Fuck you. I, you know what I'm saying? They got enough guys mm -hmm. trying to get in, me being one of them, you know. So that's how all that happened. And so I, I didn't go to any more TVs after that because I ended up going to South Africa. Uh, we would stay the whole 20. We didn't stay the whole 28 days. We stayed 21 days. And uh, that's a whole story within itself. And I, I wrote about that in my first book, Pimmy Pay Me, because I do all the countries I've been to. Man, we got over there, and it was a cluster of fuck and a half. But we got to wrestle, man, and uh, mm. got paid. Um, we just got out, Ron Starr and myself, we just got out of country uh, with the help of the U.S. Embassy. And uh, it was crazy, man. And one of the, one of the, the quote, white promoters over there, because uh, I had some undue, some, some, Sketchy character, let's just say that. And mm -hmm. 
uh, two promoters were paying us, and one of them was was just kind of like, "Nah, I'll get you tomorrow. I'll get you tomorrow." You know, like, but it all worked out. And, um, it, it was a good experience uh, to get to wrestle in South Africa. And mm-hmm. uh, anyway, that's that's that. I, I ran one sometimes, but but that's how I did the New York TV or WWF, as you know, back in the day. Uh, all because Piper walked by and saw me, and that's how I got through the Piper match. And uh, I loved it. And I eventually, when I went up to EA Sports in Vancouver, uh, you know, I was at that video game for Mayhem, and it was the first uh, game that EA's first wrestling game uh, that EA Sports at the time had done. They hadn't done wrestling yet. And I got to do it with me, Bobby Eaton, Lash LaRue, and um, uh, Buddy Lee Parker. Uh, Brad was supposed to go, Brad Armstrong, but he just got put back on the road, so he sent me. And uh, we, we stayed at the uh, Pacific Pacetes out there in uh, uh, Vancouver. It was great. Everyone at EA Sports treated us so great. But this um, hotel townhouse is where they put us at. A lot of celebrities. Uh, the lady that was EA Sports, she said there were like 27 movies and TV shows going on in and out there at that time, you know. And we got to be, I got to meet uh, uh, Leslie Nielsen. He was funny as fuck. Uh, Sarah Jessica Parker was having a, a production meeting, like right there. We were like, holy shit, you know. But one, we were sitting there one day, and here comes fucking Piper, and um, he knew Bobby Eaton, you know, more than any of them there, and more than any of us three other ones. And and he probably didn't remember me other than uh, he probably some guy done a job for me or something, you know. But very courteous at at, at, at breakfast, and the, like I say, he talked. To, he talked to all of us, but you know, him and Bobby was just a couple little things. Goes, I think it was up for a shoot, and I think he said it was an episode of Viper, that car show mm-hmm. back in the day. And he mm-hmm. goes, hey, uh, so you all be back here this evening? And like, yeah, we get back about 5.30 or 6 every night, you know. And he goes, when I get off the set, he goes, let's go to the bar. I'll take care of you guys. Like, okay, that's great, you know. Well, we go, we get picked up by limo every morning at 8.30, being a job by 9, doing it, the motion capture stuff. And at 5 o'clock, the limo would take us back. We was back there about like 5.30. Like I said, we had stopped sometimes at the package store and, you know, limo driver let us get out and get our shit. And we'd meet back at the bar. So we we all, you know, did our deal, got back together, met like a seven, you know, call your people back home, whatever. We'd meet at the bar about 7, 7.30. And uh, we got there at night and we went to, and by this time, the bartender knew us, the waitresses knew us. You know, we've been, we're staying here. Um, we've been there probably two and a half, three weeks at this point. Well, the late the the guy come up to us from the bar. He said, "Hey, just want to let y'all know the first round, uh, Mr. Piper took care of it. He can't. He won't be back in time, but he he said put on his tab. We're like, what the fuck? That's pretty cool, you know. Because mm-hmm. he he remembered the boys while I was getting that. Mm-hmm. He mm-hmm. just remembered the boys, you know, and uh, made a call and basically said if these you know guys come back in tonight, hook them up, and we you know all got a you know a couple beers, whatever it was, our, our normal stuff. We didn't go over the top, you know." But the fact was, the first couple they said, "Hey, your tab's up." Okay, you're. We had a we had a comp. We had to pay for our own liquor, but we had a, a meal tab every day. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I say, yeah, <laughs> good mm-hmm. thing to work. We had a breakfast and evening for them because they supplied lunch while we was on the job. But I thought that's pretty cool, man. The guy never forgot the boys, you know. So, uh, mm-hmm. and whether he remembered, if we'd have come back that night. I, I don't know if I'd have said, hey, you know what? I did a, got to work with you in Huntington. This and that. I didn't, you know, hey, who knows? But it, but the fact was, uh, he took care of us for that beer, you know, for a couple of beers there and didn't have to. But uh, I guess he didn't get back to later or whatever he was doing. Hell, he might have flew back to LA by that time, you know, or, mm-hmm. or wherever he's at. But uh, yeah, um, I just ramble. So just ask me some more no. or whatever. But, but I stayed no, but- here in New York. Like I said, I did them. Uh, you know, six, seven matches, something like that. I got to work with, uh, uh, real quick, uh, I got to work with Kerry Von Eric. I mean, that's, that, that's who I wanted to ask you about with, yeah. uh, with respect to the big Iron Claw movie coming out in December. Um, do you, was that match notable in your mind at all? Or, or, yeah, yeah, I tell you, uh, because I tell you what, just being in a ring, you just knew what a, a damn, uh, good athlete Kerry was, you know. Um, people, this is this after the accident, of course, and and man, he could. All I I wrestled um, several people, but but again, Kerry looked great, carried himself well. We was in the back, and uh, I went up to him and I you know, I introduced myself, and um, of course, I just 
the fuck is Kerry Von Eric, you know? And he's got this incredible body. He's just in the hallway stretching, and I start speaking to him. And um, I said, well, what do you want to do out there? And he said, basically what Piper said, really, he said, you're the heel. He said, just do whatever. And he said, uh, be there for the discus punch. And I'm like, okay. I go, anything special? He goes, no, just, you know, uh, just wrestle and do this and don't worry about it. I'm like, okay. Well, so, and he, and he didn't act, you know, people would say this and that. He didn't act better than me. He didn't act all fucked up. He just, he was just, he was just being himself the best I could tell, honestly. And, mm -hmm. and, and, um, I walked up there and I'm getting up close to gorilla position and that referee, Danny Davis was there. Not, uh, yeah. Danny Davis, the referee. I'm sorry. Um, not the, not the trainer, but the referee in WWE. Yeah. Yes. And he goes, um, where's Carrie? And I go, I don't know. I, you know, cause I'm not, I'm thinking I'm a grown ass man. I'm not supposed to be fucking watching him. You know what I'm saying? I know I'm going to go out. Cause I, 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 by this time, you know, I, so, you know, you, you go out there, some music comes on, you stay in the ring. But when it comes to the house, when the music done, you know, TV hits, you're it's recorded. You know what I'm saying? The star gets the music. Well, anyway, um, so I said, you know what? I said, how about this? I said, I just kick them and I German suplex them and we get out of here. He said, that's fine with me. You can do what the fuck you want to do. <laughs> and he started laughing because I'd say what I'd do if I was you. And I, I'm just talking to him like, yes, I don't even know the guy, but I know he's a referee. And, you know, I'm thinking, hey, you know, I'm trying to relax. And I'm, you're nervous anyway, but I'm trying to relax the atmosphere. But And he goes, I know what I, I would do if I was you. He goes, I'd fucking get Carrie out here. And I go, what? He goes, go find him. I'm like, well, fuck me. You know what I'm saying? My, I said, I'm just ribbing around, like waiting in line to go out. I'm fucking here, Jack, you know? And so, um, I just stepped back to where he was at, and uh, he was on his way, coming that way. And I, hey man, I'm up here. A couple people back. He goes, I got you, man. And that was it. We get to Gorilla, and he said, uh, just just get on me a little bit. He goes, when I wind up, I go okay. And it, but you just tell, professional, athletic, and, and easy, brother. I mean, it was easy, and um, I had a lot of respect for him uh, because of the whole Von Eric thing, you know, and. And I'm excited for this movie to come out. I've seen the trailer. Mm -hmm. uh, Looks like the best I can tell. And the things I've heard, uh, some some interviews on on different uh, podcasts and stuff. The the actors, man, really put their body on the line. They really mm -hmm. professional. Um, uh, some of the stuff I read, it it looks like it'll be really good. And I hope it is. And I, I hope it does succeed. Uh, but um, yeah, rest in peace, Carrie. I mean, I didn't. I would, you know. I got to wrestle Kerry Von Eric. There's not a lot of people that say that, but it, it was a short match. But you know what? The fact is, in that short amount of time, I could just tell how good he was and how athletic he was. And I really mm -hmm. admired that, you know, mm -hmm. that myself, even though I'm there knowing what I was supposed to be doing, that I could hang with someone like that. Now, maybe not selling out 56,000 people or something like that, but the fact that just doing TV is like, man, that's pretty damn cool, you know. So. Absolutely. When, when when you were up there, did you encounter uh, the chairman of the board, Mr. McMahon, at any time? Did you meet him? Yes. The first night I wrestled Piper, like I said, matter of fact, I got there early. And um, at the Civic Center, the way they would do it, they had it blocked off and this and that. So you're in the back. And um, uh, I was going around a corner, and um, here he came, just him and I in a hallway uh, that was marked off kind of thing. And I just – I, I, I stopped i had you know had a nice suit on this and that and i was dressed up but not dressed like that i was told to dress nicer but not have zubaz on but i had you know i didn't have his suit on either you know what I'm saying i just had a nice shirt and stuff and i said hey you know uh, bobby blaze medley how are you sir i go really an honor to be here thank you and he goes hey have a good evening and then pretty much he didn't fuck me off he just was like business you know mm -hmm. i was like damn i just meant bitch but man you know well um, I went back, let's see, again, that was what, 91, I guess it was, after Smoky Mountain shut down, uh, you know, Cornette went up there, and uh, some of the guys I knew went up there and was working and stuff, and, and Jimmy and I spoke on the phone, and it, I was already in talks with Orndorff and uh, Kevin Sullivan, so I didn't want to go on TV and mess that up if it was going to happen for me, and um, I got some pretty good advice on that, you know, because I was negotiating to, to do what I eventually did with WCW. So why go on TV and get killed? And, you know, and, and like Jimmy said, I couldn't tell you who you're going to wrestle, whether it be, you know, have a good match with Al Snow or get squashed by Sid. He goes, I'm just telling you, I can get you a couple of days. And I, 
And maybe when you come to Huntington, I'll come by and say, hey. So when I went up there, but this time I'm more smart now, you know, and I'm realizing this is Vince McMahon's building for this night. He's rented it, you know what I'm saying? That's his. So when I went up there, I, you know, I saw Sean Walkman, uh, Chris Candido and Tammy and, and just everyone I hadn't seen for a while. I, I, I saw him in the back. And uh, once again, um, I walked into a room and there was Vince, you know, and a couple people. And I walked over and spoke to him. And then uh, I just reached out my hand. I go, Mr. McMahon, sure is nice to meet you. I said, you got a first class operation here. I, I appreciate you. Let me back here and have a good day. And he just was basically like, no need who the fuck you are. Um, obviously you've wrestled around or you know, I don't know what he's fucking thinking. He's got a he's got fucking TV on his mind and, and big pay-per-views coming up. But he was very courteous and very professional. But I knew, you know, hey, this is his building for tonight. I'm gonna at least show him the respect and say thank you. So those were the two times I got to interact with them. They were both very positive, very brief and very positive. But it was no, um, hey, man, you know what? Uh, I got an idea for you or call my <laughs> office or let me have my people call you. None of that, you know. Um, I pretty much knew what I was there for because uh, I saw him uh, uh, at the other TV. I can't recall seeing him in Florida, but in um, uh, uh, up here in uh, Fort Wayne in that loop up there, Toledo, uh, I saw him there. But, again, it wasn't a speaking situation, you know what I'm saying? So I did speak to him at the Huntington Coliseum and or – uh, Civic Center back then, and again uh, in a, later on the second time, same building, um, and just a courtesy, hello, thank you, you know, um, uh, nothing disrespectful, not like that, but also it wasn't in depth, you know, like mm -hmm. hey, but, you know, whatever, not to be redundant, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I, I, haven't, I haven't heard any anybody say anything differently about uh, meeting Vince backstage. Uh, extremely polite and, uh, and yes. respectful. So yes, completely. Right. The first time it was just him and I. I mean, we're it's like you know, there's probably no one behind me for twenty feet, no one behind him for twenty feet. And we're in this big hallway, and and we're just coming to each other. So you know, we're gonna do nod or whatever. I mean, you're gonna pretty much say, hey, you know, I know who the fuck he is. He knows I must be someone if I'm still back there at this point of, of the show, you know. And uh, so, yeah, he was, I have to say, uh, every time I saw him, even though I might not have spoke to him another couple of times because it wasn't that situation, he was he was very professional, seemed very genuine. Um, and honestly, for that kind of a day, now I don't know what went on uh, with promos because I didn't do one there. I don't know what went on in production this way, that way. But as far as getting prepared for the show and stuff, Fucking completely like laid back, you know. Say like he was just like, this is my job. This is what I do. You know, it wasn't any. It, he didn't. He didn't seem bothered. Let me say that. You know, what I'm saying mm -hmm. like he just spoke to me. Hey, nice to meet you. Good. Hope you have a good day. Enjoy the show. You know, kind of thing. And that was mm -hmm. that. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I have nothing bad to say because my interaction, personally and professionally, were both both times were very good. You know, perfect. In ninety three. Sorry, I said it was my honor. You know. To meet mm. him, so. mm. In 93, you were, uh, you began a, a run with, uh, you know, Smoky Mountain Wrestling, uh, you know, one of the, uh, the last uh, great territories. I'm a huge fan, uh, full Thank disclosure. You. Can, you, can you talk about how you were brought in in your relationship with Mr. Cornette? Yeah, well, actually it started, I was in Tampa, Florida. I was at Malenko, still training. Um, and, uh, like I said, this is this is '92, actually. Okay. Okay. Um, this is um, March of '92. I just got back from South Africa, and Tommy Rogers used to come by the gym that my brother and I trained at. And then he had stopped by the gym some if uh, he's going to go back to Japan or something. The, the wrestling gym, but we worked out the same gym. Uh, man, let's see. Robert Fuller worked there. Uh, I see Pat's knock every Tuesday. I started making a lot of connections. Uh, the Bushwhackers, they they were part of that gym at the time. Um, so uh, I was getting my name out there as far as in the Tampa area because everywhere you go, there's wrestlers there, you know. Um, it's given a lot of guys live in that area. So uh, to answer your question, I was, I was going to um, uh, the gym one day, and Tommy Rogers, um, my brother, I was going in. He goes, hey, Bobby, he goes, how are you, Bobby? We're talking. And he goes, hey. You know what? He goes, aren't you from up and around Tennessee area? I go, yeah. Well, of course, geographically, depending on where you're at, where I'm in West Virginia, Ohio, two minutes, you know, right across the bridge. Tennessee, 
about three and a half, four hours, depending where you cross the line at, you know. But there's a place in Kentucky, again, you just cross two minutes over. So, you know, never mind they work this area, so it's all the same fucking area. Kentucky, Tennessee, West Virginia, whatever. So I go, yeah, I go from Kentucky right there. And he goes, man, he goes, hey, you know, Cornette's doing TVs up there, uh, or get ready to open the territory up there, not TV. He said, Cornette's get ready to open the territory up there. He goes, man, would that be something you'd be interested in? And I was like, and I had wrestled Tommy uh, before. Uh, and, and been around him before. So I was like, yeah, I mean, I got all excited. Like, yeah, yeah. And um, I was like, yeah. And he goes, well, he goes, uh, I'm going to give you Cornette's number. He goes, give him a call and tell him I told you to call. And I said, okay. So uh, again, this is this is uh, late February, early March of 92. And uh, I, I called Cornette and I said, uh, he said, hey, Bobby, hey, Bobby, I know who you are. He goes, man, I'm really busy right now. He goes, uh, give me your number, and, I, and I'll call you back as soon as I can uh, later this evening. And so I'm like, okay, thank you, you know. Well, he didn't call back, and uh, I didn't really sweat or anything, to be honest. I, I was sit, sitting there nervous like a, a schoolgirl getting ready to get asked for prom to the, but you know, about a football quarterback or something. And I was that excited, but it sounded like, ah, fuck, he, he didn't call me anyway. But uh, I saw Tommy the next day. He goes, Hey, how did talk with Jimmy go? And I go, well, honestly, they called back. Goes, what are you doing tonight about nine? And uh, I said, I'll be at the apartment hanging out probably. He goes, be by the phone. I go, okay. And uh, nine o'clock at night, Jim Cornette called me. And we spoke. And he said, hey, Bobby, go, I know who you are. Um, Tommy spoke real well of you. And he goes, uh, I, I know who you're training with. And he goes, I have a lot of respect for Boris Malenko. And he goes, I'm sure whatever you're doing, you're doing good. And I said, well, I just got back from South Africa. I'd been to Canada. I said, I'm going to be going to um, Canada again this coming summer, but I don't have anything right now other than what I'm doing independently here in, in Florida. And he goes, send me your information. And I did. And I, I put a VHS tape together and five-minute highlights or whatever it was and some pictures and sent it. And he goes, you know, and I said I would, and I did. Well, they started TVs about that time, about 92, that that. February, March, they, they'd already done one or two, whatever it was. Um, anyway, I uh, stayed in touch with them. I, I called them probably April and May, and then in June. And in June, he goes, hey, we're going to be in Paintsville, Kentucky. Um, are you near there? And I go, yeah, I'm like an hour away. And so I was in between. I moved back to Kentucky. I had like six weeks before I was between Kentucky or Florida and going back to Canada. So I just lined up an old job here at the YMCA, like doing a school program, you know, just, just you know, having fun uh, for a summer program for the kids for six weeks. I thought, okay, um, you know, I'll just do that, hang out, see some of my buddies, you know, and uh, train, and then I'll be right back on the road making money again up there in Canada. So I'd made, I'd made about $400, $500 a week down in Florida just wrestling and training people and and, you know, really getting a flow of just this, I can do this now, you know. And um, anyway, I, I I remember the date, whatever it was, it was June something. And um, I drive, I get up, so well, fuck, that's just a little bit down the road there. I put me back some more pictures and stuff updated. And I go into um, to Paintsville, and I'm waiting in high school gym. And uh, just so happened, I knew who, I didn't know him personally at the time. I knew who was over the fundraiser that was for the firemen and stuff. And I have family up that area. So uh, I spoke to him and he goes, yeah, he goes, man, I hope he's a big wrestling fan of this nigga. I hope you hope you do good. Ten minutes later, here comes Cornette and uh, he, he comes in a building and it's hotter than hell. And he goes, everywhere I go, it's heat everywhere. And he just comes in bitching right out of the car, you know, and I'm just sitting on a bench and uh, I'm not even giving the guy time to shit, to be honest with you. You know what I'm saying? Like, so the guy jumped up, I go, hey, Jim Cornette, Bobby Blaze, nice to meet you in person. He goes, he just started, oh, Bobby, I done. we've been talking forever. Uh, hey, let me put my stuff down, take a shit, and just meet me in the middle. He was just just right off the bat, like, boom, would have shook him. But, see, I had met Cornette before through Bobby Eaton, and, and it, but however briefly. He didn't know me other than the phone calls. But um, I was – Bobby Eaton was one of the ones I knew in the business when I first got in because he's such a nice guy. Mm. And I'd see him in Huntington when they'd wrestle. I'd see him in Charleston, and he'd always – Meet me right there at the cart and shake my hand. He go, you know, Bobby didn't speak a lot, but he go, hey, boy, how you doing? How you doing? And I go, good. He goes, you talk, you doing this? You resting? I, I tell him what I was doing. He goes, and one time he didn't tell, he asked Corey, Jimmy, come here. 
and he put me on. He goes, this is this is Bobby, another Bobby. And I spoke to Jim Cornette like, hey, how you doing? I marked out, of course, because I had like, like I said, I, I don't think I'd been in Malenko's at that point. But uh, it's just funny, like, you know, to know what happens in the future, you know, with, mm-hmm. with Bobby and myself and Jimmy. Way with that night, so I'm in Paintsville, and Jimmy goes, does his shit, whatever he has to do, legitimately does his business and comes back out. And we sit down and he goes, uh, yeah, he goes, I, he goes, I told you to call me. You, you didn't stop calling me. I go, no. He goes, I told you I'd have something for you. Maybe he goes, um, I'm telling you, so we're getting this TV going. And he said, uh, uh, what are you doing? What are you doing this evening? I said, I drove up to meet you. And he goes, what, what else uh, you got planned? I said, well, I'm getting ready to go back to Canada in a couple of weeks. I think my starting that like July 5th or something, I get this middle of June. And I'm going to be up there for like the next 18 weeks this year. And uh, he goes, won't you? And I was going to do it anyway. He goes, won't you stick around and watch the show and see where you might fit in at? And I go, fuck, <laughs> yes, of course, you know. And uh, he goes, I go back to this side, the hill side, face side. I went back, and by the time I went to, to the side I knew to go to, uh, because I'd been in that building before, and uh, I'd played ball there and stuff. Excuse me there. And uh, I saw Robert Gibson, and I'd met him before. I saw Brian Lee, who I'd met in Tampa, but briefly. They gave him that push on WCW there for just that short time he was there. And then uh, Scott Armstrong was Dixie Dynamite. And uh, uh, the only other, and when I spoke to them, and Brian was like, hey, you coming in? I go, I don't know yet. You know, I go, um, we'll, we'll see. I go, I'm just talking to Jimmy, you know, see what's going on. And uh, Mark Curtis, Brian Hildebrandt, he, he came over and put me over huge, like, Man, you're down there going through Malenko's training and this and that. And he's just marking out about people we know and common. And I loved it, you know. And so um, I, I watched the show. It was a really good show. i like, holy shit, did, did these guys can go and let's see what happens. So I went to um, Canada. I came home. Um, I had uh, I did some independent stuff just around this area here. Um and I had a tour lined up to go to Australia, excuse me, beginning of February. So I was going to be home October, December, and January, like those three months. So I was like, okay. Um, you know, I just went back again, back to the gym, doing personal training, you know, do, do whatever it was, you know, just just getting your gimmick over, you know, working mm-hmm. or whatever, you know what I'm saying? And because uh, I know something better is coming along. And um, so I went to go, I went to Australia. And uh, that was um, February of 90. Now we're in 93. So I come back in uh, the middle of March of 93 from over in Australia. And um, uh, Bobby Fulton calls me. And uh, I'd only been home a couple of days. And he's like, hey, I got your number from Jim Cornette. I'm going to run a show up here in uh, this town in Ohio, blah, blah. And he's like, I've heard a lot of good things about you from uh, Tommy and Dean. And I was like, oh, so Dean put me over, that little bastard. I always fuck around with Dean because I love him so much. And he goes, oh, you know Dean uh, that well. And I go, well, I go, Dean and I have this crazy relationship. I said, I love him to death, you know, but I said, he helped me so much. I just, we joke, you know. And that's just the way I talk anyway, just messing around. Cause I, I knew Tommy too. Like I said, he wanted to put me in touch. He goes, why did they both really put you over, man? I go, well, I'll be there, you know. So I went up and I did a show for Bobby Fulton. And, uh, and he paid me and, uh, he said, I'll be in touch with, and I got a job and I tell people this to this day when I'm training or whatever, <laughs> something about these bathrooms, I'm telling you, I was, I was in a locker room at this high school gym somewhere up in Ohio and Bobby Fulton comes in. I stood up and I shook his arm, jet lag a little bit. Come with me, come with me. And he, he's all Bobby, just Bobby. And he goes, lock up with me. I locked up with him like that. And like I said, I've been over in Australia for like 22, 23 days, whatever it was and wrestling every damn night. And he goes, Oh, that, that's good. He goes, I'll see you the first, third main event. I'll see you out there. And like, what the hell? But he'd do a show with that small crew, and he'd work the first show, set up the captain's match. He'd come back up, third match with a ninja. He had actually the uh, turtle, that one, a ninja turtle. He was mm-hmm. at. Mm-hmm. He did that, and then he'd come back out in a main event, set up that captain's match and the tag team match. I didn't learn out. I didn't learn about that till later on. He got that Dallas doing those small crews. Rip Rogers smart me up. He goes, Bobby, you know where he got that? He got these stowed out there in Dallas. That's why we're these small ass shows, uh, crew wise. And I like, yeah, Rip, Rip, I love Rip to death. And mm-hmm. anyways, back to the story. Um, I got a job locked up just in a lock, you know. And so uh, uh, Bobby called me next night. He like thanked me and this and that. And he said, uh, I'm getting ready. This guy, I, he goes, I run a lot of shows. This guy's get ready. 
to quit his job changing or something. And I was like, okay. I go, well, I'll be honest with you. I go, I can't come. I went like four and a half, five hours. Uh, and I said, I can't come that far for what you pay. I mean, it wasn't bad. It was just like, you know, maybe $50, but I'm like, I, I could make that just staying here at the gym. You know what I'm saying? Don't have to travel, whatever. And he goes, oh no. He goes, this, this, he goes, I'll pay you X amount and this and that. And I was like, oh, that sounds more reasonable. He goes, plus he's from Chill Coffee, which is like 45 minutes from me. He said, now I run town. He goes, I normally don't run the town he ran, because this is way up by Pittsburgh, like Wheeling, West Virginia. You know, mm -hmm. wise, it was a little bit far from me, but he goes, oh, most of my shows are right probably within two hours of your home, because he kind of knew his tri-state. Oh, okay, that even works even better then, you know, and it did, and and, and Bobby's been a man of his word ever since then, but um, what happened was, I was, um, like I said, I'd been jet-lagged, I'd done the matches, and I'd met him in the first, third, <laughs> I had to wrestle him in the first for a captain's match. I met him, beat the ninja turtle up. Then in the main event, I come back with someone else, and we had to, you know. Well, about a week goes by, and uh, I, I was laying in, just crashed out, you know. And uh, just after Blizzard of 93, right after that, that was March, and um, got a phone call from Cornette. And he goes, hey, Bobby, he goes, uh, how would you like to have a tryout? And I was like, <laughs> I was like, pull, I'm like, ah, really? You know, yeah, yeah. He goes, listen, I'm going to be at, we're going to be in Beckley uh, this ex, this day from Sunday, um, Sunday afternoon show. Could you make it? And I'm like two hours from Beckley. And he goes, um, uh, like to have you in for your tryout match. I said, I'll be there. And I had, um, I went there and uh, I saw um, uh, Jimmy Golden, Helu Malenko. And, and he was real courteous to me. Tom Pritchard put me over because he knew Dean and Joe and um, and uh, the Fulton, you know, and, and Tommy. And then uh, um, I was sitting there and Mark Curtis come in and he just put me over like huge because, again, we're, we're such – he got his name, honestly, Mark. You know, he, he we just love the business and we talked. And finally, Cornette said, <laughs> again, here it goes. He goes, hey, buddy. <laughs> Come here. We went to the men's restroom. He left. <laughs> that's, that's where the meetings take place, man. Yeah. And uh, I go in there, and uh, there's fucking Brian Lee, you know. And he goes, hey, Bobby, this is Brian Lee. I go, hey, Brian. Which I knew him because I met him but didn't know him. And Jimmy goes, uh, he's our uh, he's our first champion. He's our TV champion. He goes, uh, you have a problem putting him over? And I looked at Brian, and I, I just I'm sitting there looking at Jimmy, and I look at Brian. I put my hand up. I go, Jimmy. This motherfucker like six foot eight, 300 pounds jacked. I said, I have no problem whatsoever. I looked at Brian. I said, what's your finish? He goes, let's call the final countdown. And I do that. I said, bro, whatever you want to do. He goes, he goes, no, whatever you want to do, you're the heel. Just take my finish. All right. So we, you know, just a gentleman's agreement. And I got in the ring, sack or third match, whatever it was. And uh, no TV or anything, just the Sunday afternoon show, a couple hundred, 300, 400 people. What it was, Becky would draw a little bit uh, back then. Not as good as it had in the past from what I heard, but it, but for Smoky Mountain, it's a good little, you know, every six, eight-week town. And uh, I lock up with Brian about two or three times and do some moves, and I uh, take some bumps for him. And he keeps saying, in the way Brian talks, he said, I dare Cornette to book you. I dare him to book you. I'm like, am I fucking up thinking – He's daring him because I'm so bad. What are they saying? Because I'm good. That you know. I, anyway, the referee kept saying, "Oh, that's a hell of a bump." This and they're putting me over the whole time, and I'm just calling a match. I had to go ten minutes, and Brian just let me call it, and I just, I just took my bumps and this and that, and I said something like, uh, uh, "Move in the corner, start your comeback. I'll bump for you." And I'd set it up that way. I, I had always, and, and I put him in the corner done something, I missed, spun out, and there he was, you know, his boot was there, his punch was there, whatever whatever he did, and finally he spun me up on his shoulder, dropped me down, spun me up, one, two, three, thank you, I went in the back, and I saw him and Cornette talking, and uh, uh, he went right to Cornette and said, man, give this guy a job, and I saw him talking, so I went over and sat back down in the babyface locker room, or heel locker room, rather, and uh, next thing I know, a door swing was open, and it's Brian, and uh by this other match is going on, I'm just unlaced my boots. I'm gonna go out and watch the matches, you know, but I'm just uh, doing my boots there. And Brian goes, Hey, man, I just want you to know, I talked to Cornette for you. He goes, I hope you get a job here. And I go, Hey, I stood up, I shanked, him. I thank you very much, you know. And I went over and I went out and I watched the rest of the matches. Sandy Scott come and get my paycheck. And um, uh, Jimmy spoke to me just one more time. He goes, Hey, if something comes up, 
I'll keep you in mind. And uh, so that's how I got my tryout match. And then the way I got hired about the following, that was at the middle of March in April. Uh, now we go full almost from nine months to almost a year now since I've been in contact with them that I got this tryout. And I knew I wanted to be there. And uh, uh, Jimmy Cornette called me. They'd done a Bluegrass Bra, which was an annual show that used to do really, really well in, in Pikeville, Kentucky during Hillbilly Days. And what had happened, it was uh, Ricky and Robert, I think Arn, I think it was that match with, uh, uh, and against the body with Stan and, and Bobby and um, Tom. And I guess uh, Robert and Bobby were fighting up on the, on the uh, basketball goal. And when they got loose or swung loose or whatever, Robert twisted his ankle really bad. And he was coming in from Pensacola, Florida for two and three days or four, whatever they worked, you know. And uh, Jimmy called me up and said, hey, man, Robert Gibson got hurt. Uh, he explained it to me. He goes, would you you want to come in? we got like a four-day loop in Kentucky. I'm like, yeah. He goes, I'm just going to – he goes, uh, I'm going to move uh, – Tim Horner up to the main event with Ricky, and he goes, you'll just come in and work the first match with uh, Tom Pritchard. And I'm like, uh, okay. So every night for the first three nights, I'm an opening match, 15-minute time limit. So we get about eight to 10-minute opening match in. I'm out there with Cornette, who basically owns the company or runs it. He's managing. I'm with Tom Pritchard, one of the fucking top talents that I really respect. The plus, he'd already put me over that first night, knowing just from the Malenko's and Tommy and Bobby and stuff. And he just called the match and I was there for everything. And um, little small town like a tuck guy. So how cool is that? You get to perform right in front of the fucking boss and one of the top stars of the territory, you know. And I drove back home because all like an hour and a half away from my house each night. And um, I, I did that. And on the fourth night, uh, the uh, well, first of all, third night was Kevin saw him, I was telling you about him earlier. They had a battle royal that third night on, on, on the loop. And I'd seen him wrestling Brian Lee at this point every night, you know, beating the hell out of Brian. And that's what I, that battle royal, um, I saw him. I was like, he's going to come right at me and kill me for whatever reason. I had it in my mind because I've seen him wrestle in Florida and I saw him up there, you know, and, and he come right towards me in that third night at battle royal. And he goes, I hear you. I hear Larry Malenko train you. And he started back me at the corner, light as can be. And I said, yes, sir, yes, sir. I, I'm waiting for him to just chop me, beat me up. He goes, put your hand on top of my head. I'm like, what? And I'm locked up with him, and I'm holding him in the corner. He goes, put your hand on top of my head. I'm like, well, fuck. So I just put my hand, you know, from lock up, I put it on top of his head. He ran about to the middle of the ring, jumped over the top rope and threw himself out. And, I'm, I'm all, and he turned around, he goes, you Bobby Blaze, you know he's doing his, his Boston. Me over, but he's done that. You threw me out. I'm gonna get you. And I thought, oh my God, that's getting over. Kevin, I mean, I just he was so professional, and, and like I said, I have a lot of respect for Kevin. Uh, he's been to my home uh, with a seminar. I did. I just he come up and visited me. He was he happened to be about an hour away up in West Virginia, and a promoter brought him down. They I just happened to have a ring out here. Kevin Sullivan showed up and spent about four hours. I was like, holy shit, man, you know. But this was years later, of course. But um, anyway, uh, the fourth night, we're in that town, Paintsville again. Uh, this is about a year earlier. We was talking about, you know, I met Cornette there. Well, this is not quite a year. And it's it's about April, like I said. And uh, uh, I'm sitting there lacing my boots. And Mark Curtis comes to me and goes, uh, hey, Bobby, what's your finish? And I go, I'm serious. I'm I'm joking, but I'm serious. I go, hell, uh, you know, putting Doc over the middle of the ring. I said, I guess look at the lights. I, I'm fi I'm fishing for what he's just fucking around. Like, yeah, whatever, whatever Doc wants, you know. And he goes, no. He goes, you understand what I'm asking? I go, what? He goes, we brought someone. Jimmy brought someone in to put you over. He said, what's your finish? You're going over. And I'm like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, just drop kick off the top rope as a baby face. And he goes, okay. And I go, who who's the guy? He goes. He told me, got in Mike Sampson. I go, oh, I go, I know Mike from Independence. I knew him for years. I said, oh, it's Mike. I said, you know what? Just tell him to listen, have a good match, and I appreciate it. And uh, sure enough, I went out there, and this guy used to have a good body on the gym and super nice guy and a good worker, hell of a worker. And, you know, I had a good crowd following because, like I said, it's only about an hour from my house and had family up there. And so that fourth night, you know, I go out there and fucking get a victory in like the first match instead of putting Tom over, you know, and like, Jimmy told me, paid me and said, hey, if something comes up, you know, here's our TV dates. 
what do you think? I, I, so I'd done like two or three TVs and we were now fast forward. Uh, I was getting a lot of bookings, but what not out, out of, out of the 12 to 15 I had, I was getting about probably four to six a month. Cause it's kind of close. And, um, so I did that in uh, May, June, and then we were like somewhere in July. I just remember being hotter than hell, been up West Virginia and Jimmy and I'd done a couple of TVs and Jimmy said, uh, I had black and red for the Malenko colors on a uh, black trunk with red lettering and black boot with red lettering. He goes, you got something more flashy. And, and I said, yes, I do. And I had all this airbrush stuff already done up. And he goes, wear that for now on. I got something in mind for you. I said, yes, sir. And so that's when I really started, you know, just, he just kept, kept me there, man. Getting my first break in the U S you know, hell I'd wrestle in Canada, uh, South Africa, uh, Australia, you know, so I, I'd been, I'd been around a few places and all over Florida, all over this tri-state area, you know, and, uh, when, when the opportunity, uh, was given to me, I was there to take it, you know, um, and, and Jimmy was, I'm a cornet guy, you know, I love Jimmy. I, when I said Kevin Sullivan has one of the greatest brains in this wrestling business to me, I think it's Kevin Sullivan and Jim Cornette. Them guys are geniuses and I respect them both. I've worked with them both. I've thrown out another name to you, and that's Bobby Fulton, you know, and I'm working his shows when I'm not down south work for Jimmy's shows. He had put me under a hood, and I'd be Golden Boy Adonis or the Great Bolo the Third or something just for his gimmick shows, you know, or a gimmick on his show, rather. And uh, uh, so I was getting a lot of experience real quick. And uh, But I was, what I say is, and I, again, this is one of my books, and again, we'll go to that plug later on, but I was around Jim Cornette and uh, Kevin Sullivan. And I've been around Malenko first and then, and then Bobby Fulton some, how could I not learn only mm. you know, and if and I had a, a desire to learn, I love this business that we talked about. So when, when Ricky Morton come to me at a gimmick table and said, Bobby, watch how I sell tonight. I knew it wasn't Ricky. I could hear Ricky telling me, but I, I knew it came from the office. The way, the way, Jim, the way Ricky and I spoke to each other, and I love Ricky Morton to death too. And uh, no, Ricky, this is Bobby Blaze, not you. Did we get the Spider Man thing going sometimes? <laughs> it's, it's a gimmick going right now. Uh, the local news guy even come up to me and said, "Hey, Ricky," and I turn around. And I say, "I'm Bobby." But, oh yeah, but whatever. So we just rip going us right now. Um, uh, anyway, uh, I could tell he was like encouraged me to watch his match, watch himself because Jimmy had plans for me to be that baby face, you know. And then later in the evening at night, I was room with Robert, and Robert said, hey, they had you do that for a reason. I said, yeah, I figured as much. He told me what the deal was, and he goes, well, now when you work with Tony, this is what's going to happen. I'm like, oh, this, this is good, you know. So they was feed me stuff little by little. So Because mm -hmm. Jimmy's in the locker room, so, you know, it was just one of those things back and forth. And I'm like, ah, okay. I, so how can I – if I smartened up is what I'm saying because I've got to be around these guys and listen to them. And, and and take to heart what they were saying. So they knew I was serious and wanted to be there, you know. And then um, some time went on, and, and Jimmy told me, he said, uh, I've got this guy. I've been having my own for a little while, and I uh, think we'll bring him in and have you do a program with him. And I'm like, okay. You know, and he told me his name was Chris Candido. And um, I'm like, oh, it's, you know, I, okay. And I was at Knoxville Civic Coliseum on a Sunday afternoon show, and I come around a corner, and here comes this guy I'm just – fucking jolly happy as can be like hey hey bobby blaze come here and he just i'd say mark he's no gimmicks needed you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. I, he mm -hmm. goes hey and he come just right towards me put his hand he goes hey man i'm chris candido he goes i go yeah, i know who you are he goes, and we just hit it off man he goes and he had driven over from memphis they had a sunday afternoon off and and they might have went to jonesboro arkansas or something but he'd come over to, to knoxville to meet with jimmy and also he met me in person and I thought that's pretty cool and watch the show too, of course, and, and see where he fit in. And um, we just kicked it off, man. And like, yeah. And he goes, man, I'm a fan of yours. Uh, I've got this, been catching up on the, what they've been doing with you. And it wasn't a lot that time as far as like doing a lot. I just was doing what I did. I did good. And it's like, uh, yeah, when he, and I never forget, he said, look here. And he put out a piece of paper that had his payoff from Memphis on it. And like, you know, Blah blah blah. He goes, man. He goes, I'll be so glad to get out there. He goes, it, it's been a learning experience. He goes, I'm I'm ready to come over here. 
and I go, man, I go over here's pretty good. I said, and I wasn't getting rich or, you know, like, but, but I did pretty good because Jimmy paid me really good for my, what I, at that time, but also the gimmicks and a baby face getting over the gimmick sales, man. You could sell the pictures, the t-shirts, the, the, what I had wristbands, hats, whatever it was, you know, whatever the gimmick, sign the autograph, whatever. Like you could always make, I can at least usually make my hotel, my gas money. So when I got my check on, usually a Monday afternoon, I never had to cut into my check to travel or perform, you know, uh, which was good. Again, I wasn't getting rich, but uh, it kept me alive and kept my dream alive. And I was doing something I loved to do. And it was a great business. And, and Smoky Mountain Locker Room, for the most part, 98% of the time, uh, the morale was so good. You know, uh, we had a good mixture of young uh, up and comers willing to learn and listen and work hard till we had the veterans that were, you know, there was some resistance a little bit at the, uh, for the heel couple, like, ah, you know, got put this guy on that, but it was, it was just them being like, you know, Hey, it, but they eased up, you know what I'm saying? Like no one likes to just put over the new guy, but there's a reason for it. And once they, and they saw Cornette's vision, that was a thing. We bought into what Jimmy sold, you know what I'm saying? We, he had stuff. And he's like, what about this? Then I mean, I wasn't maybe after three TV. Go, Bobby, from now on, get here at this time for the production meeting. He'd hand me a sheet, and I'd learned that. You know, instead of watching, I'm like, shit. I want first, second, third, fourth segment. Which one's my? Oh, I'm on. I'm on the first three segments today. Uh, that's good. And I started figuring, the listening how he spoke to the people. And of course, you know, Jimmy's Jimmy, but but as far as professionally, you know, saying like this. This is his company. This is his baby. He wants to see it do good. And um, it, it was a great experience for me. Uh, it was a great time uh, of my life to, to be involved in professional wrestling. Uh, and, well, and I, I, I think I think this is a, a good point to – we're going to have to do a part two to get into oh. your – we'll start with uh, one of the questions I want, want to get into detail with you next time yeah. is on your program with, with Candido. And, okay. and your whole your whole uh, run in Smoky Mountain, along with your WCW tenure, where, okay. where if you're able, we definitely have to do that. And the fans, stay tuned to Cheap Heat Productions to okay. find the schedule up for that. But before uh, we we cut this one off, Bobby, yeah. what where can the fans find you? And let's talk about where they can get a hold of your excellent books and yeah. other merch. Well, first of all, thanks for saying they're excellent. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, I'm on Twitter and Instagram. I'm not on Facebook. So if anyone's out there saying it was, I have not been on that for years. I'm at Bobby Blaze 744. That's my football and basketball number. So it's just Bobby Blaze 744. Um, I've got a good interaction going on Twitter. I really like that. But it's so, but my Instagram, I really started building it back up here more recently. Um, you can contact me there by direct message and just, hey, I'm interested in a book or or what have you. And I do send out personal copies. Uh, you know, they're $20 plus $5 for shipping and handling. Um, but you can also go to Amazon and you can go to Bobby Blaze Smedley and they're $15.95. You've got Prime, of course, there's no shipping, but you don't get the autograph for the personalization. But you can order it on Amazon and I, I encourage you to do some because you can even download it for at five dollars or something if you got a, a kindle reader available but um if you go to bobby blaze smedley on amazon or let's go type in pin me pay me have boostable travel that's my first book it'll pop right up take you to amazon site um i kicked out on two the educational wrestler is right there as well um again just type it in and it, it'll it'll show you excuse me uh where it's at uh, there's a couple other books that are like just ebooks only, and they're like two ninety nine. One of them is called Yard Time. It's just a, it's actually a chapter out of the uh, I kicked out on two. Uh, then there's a funny little uh, Christmas story uh, that I run every year. That I was at a contest in, and that's why I did that book. It's just, it's a short story. I won't say it's a book, short story. There's another one of adult material in there, but again, I was in a writer's contest in that genre. And so I just, you know, entered them to keep my brain, you know, whatever, uh, active at the time, um, encouraged to do so uh, by one of the other authors I was involved with uh, on, on the uh, learning how to publish a book and things. So anyway, the best thing to do, though, honestly, get a hold of me on Twitter or Instagram at BobbyBlaze744. 
Um, I love doing podcasts. I appreciate you putting me on. Um, get a hold of me, and if you if you doing if you don't do anything else, this this is why. Please please do this. Order the book from Amazon, and then if you see me in person somewhere, um, I'll sign it. No fee to sign or anything. Like if you already bought a copy, I'll sign it. You know, if you buy it through me, um, again, I just personalize it through you know from the local mail mail facility. But um, also, I've got T-shirts that are available. Um, if you go to Collar and Elbow, uh, Collar X Elbow brand, if you use the code name Blaze, you get 10% off. Uh, this shirt here, Sean, I have to put him over. He, I got this gimmick. It's no longer available uh, with 10-minute time limit. This is Bobby the Kingslayer Blaze t-shirt. I'm working on getting those done with uh, uh, Collar and Elbow along, but I got the retro Blaze over there. Again, just use uh, Blaze for 10% off. But really? Uh, don't mean to rant. Just get a hold of me on Twitter, or Instagram, Bobby Blaze seven forty four. I'll be glad to hear from you. and let them know that you know. Hey, you enjoyed my uh, Jack and I uh, the conversation we've had. And Jack, I I really do appreciate the questions. I look forward to doing a second part. You just let yeah. me know when schedule wise, we'll work it out, man. Yeah, uh, me been too. To do it for a while. Me too. I've like I said uh, off air. I got a ton to ask you, and we'll definitely hook that up. And yep. fans, make sure you check out uh, Bobby's merch. Yeah. Make sure you check out his books. They're, they're excellent reads. And we will uh, put our heads together and uh, get another uh, interview scheduled. But until then, that's yep. it for this edition of the Cheap Heat Productions Wrestling Podcast. Thanks to Bobby Blaze once again. And we will talk to you soon. Take care, everybody.